Okay, so I'm going to probably keep it a little bit shorter than uh, the people who started. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about a couple of aspects uh, of Lois Dietz syndrome, which uh, for some of you probably in the grand scheme of things may not be uh, too worrisome, but uh, we can discuss in the afternoon sessions that uh, some aspects of this may require different intervention or support uh, as time goes on over your life. So <clears throat> there are a number of children uh, with Lois Dietz syndrome that have low muscle tone. So it's called hypotonia. It's not a diagnosis, but it's low muscle tone. This was a patient who I saw for the first time just before Lois Dietz syndrome was uh, diagnosed, actually. So we didn't know what he had. Uh, so he showed up in my hypotonia clinic. And if you see him sitting there, you see him a little bit hunched over. So he should be sitting much straighter. Um, <clears throat> and that is something which we probably see most often in the younger uh, children with Lois Dietz syndrome, that they have this low tone, which is mostly this axial low tone. And then I saw him several years later, and then uh, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Dietz and Dr. Lois made the diagnosis, and then we actually knew what he had. Uh, I have to say that, um, like many other children with Lois Dietz syndrome, his muscle tone and low tone was really not a big issue at the age of uh, three and four and older. So he was uh, not really complaining much about this, and <clears throat> I think that's probably true for most of the patients, although I'm more than happy and, and actually excited to listen to some of you this afternoon to see whether you have different observations. When you talk about tone, and I think that is important specifically for the parents who have smaller children, there are two things you should think about. One is uh, there's a difference between having low tone and having weakness. So if you think about what muscle tone actually is, the best example I can give you is just when you think about how you brush your teeth then there are lots of muscles that have to contract and then relax at the same time if you think about the motion of what you have to do. And that is all mostly controlled by the tone of the muscle, not so much by the strength. So there are a number of uh, uh, patients, and to be honest, probably over half of them in my clinic with low muscle tone, that are floppy, maybe, and that have decreased tone. But if you actually push them, and try to see how much muscle, muscle strength they actually have, it's fairly good. And that is at least my limited experience in patients with low Dietz syndrome, that there is low muscle tone, but it's really uh, not true weakness, which is a good thing because that usually tends to improve as patients get older, even uh, in the young uh, children's age. And then the only aspect I want to talk to you a little bit about is that there is a difference between uh, an impact on your muscle tone, whether you have a central problem or whether you have a peripheral problem. And some of you probably know that there are forms of Lois Dietz syndrome that's go, that go along with cognitive disabilities and cognitive challenges. And the few patients I've seen with uh, cognitive challenges and low muscle tone really have a very different type of picture than the ones who don't, because that is a central type of low muscle tone, which really mainly affects the main body or the, at the main axis of the body when I, when I talk about axial mus muscle and not so much the, uh, the uh, peripheral muscles. And when you, <clears throat> but for most of the patients, I think it's really just the legs and the arms where, where tone is an issue. But you need to keep this in mind if you have a more severe form of Lowe's Dietz syndrome, then the, the hypotonia itself is more complex. So how do you look at this? Um, often, uh, the children who have a more peripheral hypotonia uh, um, symptomatology are the ones <clears throat> that have sometimes paucity of anti-gravity movements, specifically when they're younger. This is not an issue when they get older. And when you have a more central cause, then you obviously have issues <clears throat> with your alertness in general and the cognitive development, and then it's more the truncal weakness I was talking about. One of the issues in LDS, and that is in my mind at the moment, probably the main reason for low muscle tone is the hypermobility of, uh, of your joints. And you can see that almost every joint here uh, of your body can be associated with this. And this is when your joints and your ligaments <coughs> are hyperextensible, then the pull on the muscles is decreased. And 
with that connection being decreased, you have an impact on your general muscle tone. So when I was in Dr. Dietz's laboratory, we were clearly able to establish that the skeletal muscle itself is abnormal in Marfan syndrome. I'm not quite sure we know this uh, in Lois Dietz syndrome, is it? So it's also in Lois Dietz because that happened after I left Dr. Dietz's lab. Uh, <clears throat> so, and, and I think that's an important information because uh, when we think about how this happens and why the muscle is affected in addition to the joints, uh, in terms of the pathogenesis of the disease. And some of you, specifically the older patients who are here or when you have children who get older, while weakness in itself may not be a problem for you, you will probably find yourself in a situation where you're not going to be able to build much of muscle mass. Now, you shouldn't go to the gym anyway and do any strenuous exercise, but even if you do mild exercises to increase your strength, because you want to increase your muscle mass, that's probably going to be an issue over your lifetime. That is our experience from patients with Marfan syndrome. And if Dr. Dietz confirms that there are similar findings now in the mice, in the mouse models for Lois Dietz syndrome, then we can probably extrapolate our knowledge from the Marfan syndrome to this. And, and it's probably something you should know about, and we can talk about this afternoon. Scoliosis happens in about 51% in about uh, uh, patients, uh, so this is easily uh, monitorable and should be something every physician who sees you, who gives you a full body exam and is not just focusing on one aspect of your body, should always look at. And if there's any kind of doubt uh, whether there might be uh, a slight curvature in your spine when you do a physical exam, you should request and hopefully get uh, an x-ray and that can be monitored over time, and you can do interventions about this uh, until it's too late in this case, where you, should, you shouldn't really get to a point like this with necessary interventions. Uh, Gretchen, well, it's here, Oswald, but she got married in the meantime. Um, uh, McCormick had a wonderful study a few years ago where she looked at other musculoskeletal abnormalities, and I think one of the things uh, which are probably most important to mention are cervical spine abnormalities. Um, <clears throat> I'm including them here not because I think they are the result of any low muscle tone or skeletal muscle issues. I think they are a separate entity in itself, but it's important that you monitor for this uh, and that you uh, go uh, to have interventions done if it's necessary because that can have an impact on how much activity and physical activity and what type of physical activity you and or your children can do. Uh, a very high number of patients is born uh, with club foot uh, deformities and here you see some other uh, deformities of the foot, how it's going to turn in. Again, a lot of interventions can be done not only for the club foot but even for the foot deformity here. And I think the more you do about this, and I think that's the nature of what we'll discuss this afternoon, the more you ensure that any kind of physical activity is not going to cause any pain, is not going to cause any discomfort, and, and is not going to cause any problems later on when you put strain on your extremities uh, um, as you get older. Uh, this is a table which uh, uh, summarizes the findings from Gretchen's paper. Uh, we probably don't have to go through this in too much detail. Uh, this is a slide I got from Hal because I was asked to comment briefly on some ophthalmological features, so eye findings. So everybody knows that uh, hypertelorism occurs in over half of patients uh, with Lois Dietz syndrome. And then there are about 20% uh, of patients here who have what we call exotropia. I'll show you a picture of this in a second. And probably over 60% of patients um, <clears throat> have blue sclera. And um, one of the findings of retinal detachment is observed, but according to Hal's observation, very rare. Um, this is a remarkable finding. I remember the day when uh, I was still at Hopkins when Hal called me and said, I think that's a sign of patients with Lois Dietz syndrome. Uh, when he has observed this in, I don't know how many patients it was, but it is true that there is this small little vein over your, above your nose, which is a really important clinical feature, and um, <clears throat> we often 
uh, when people ask me uh, ask me about a patient whether they have a connective tissue disease, I always ask this question because it's very helpful in guiding you towards certain workup of what should be done uh, in terms of diagnosis. Here you see uh, the exotropia, which can be quite significant. And if it's significant like this in, in the patients I'm showing you here, again, it's a slide from Dr. Dietz, uh, then you may uh, require surgery for this, and, um, and you should not be shy about going about this because it will have a better outcome after that. Skin findings, one quick word. Um, um, most patients have thin, uh, translucent skin. Uh, it can feel a little bit smooth uh, in most of the patients, and one of the big distinguishing features of skin findings as compared to Marfan syndrome is that you have easy bruising, which lots of other connective tissue disorders, something like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or so, uh, have. You can have problems with scar healing. so. Uh, that can become an issue if you have to undergo surgeries for things like, for example, a hernia. And there's a fairly high number of patients that have dural ectasia, uh, but there are no real lung complications. Something like pneumothorax is, is observed, but it's very rare. And I stop here, and we probably can move on and we can answer questions uh, in the afternoon. <laughs>